let me let me just uh, quickly summarize what we had on the last lecture, and then we will continue. Um, so we did uh, we looked at the binary system and uh, derived in a leading a leading order gravitational wave <coughs> phase and uh, uh, amplitude um, of gravitational waves, which is emitted by binary system. This, is, this was valid only when the bodies are widely separated, and uh, of course it, the whole approach breaks down as you're coming closer and closer. And then I gave you an idea how to build the full waveform without any details, but I hope you, will, you got the idea. And then, what did we do next? Ah, yes, we looked at the principle of detection interaction of uh, interferometer, laser interferometer with gravitational wave. And we saw that you know, for ground-based detectors, we can cover it completely by global, global local inertial frame. And uh, then it simplifies our calculations. And uh, this is not general. Uh, more general would be to use the, the transverse traceless gauge. And this is true when gravitational wavelength is comparable to the size of your detector. And that's what happens in LISA, and we will talk about LISA today. Uh, and I stop somewhere here. I uh, already went through this slide. I want just to emphasize a few things. So this is displacement in the arms of the interferometer caused by gravitational wave. First of all, I want to emphasize again that uh, it's proportional to the size of your detector. And uh, that's why we need the large devices. So unfortunately, to detect gravitational waves, you really need something big. And to give you an idea, so displacement of, corresponding to 10 to minus 22 strain, so current sensitivity is 10 to minus 23, is 10 to the minus 16 centimeters. And one of the ideas to build this fabri perot cavity is to increase this effective <coughs> delta L, so to let light bounce between these two mirrors. And also I want to emphasize uh, here its uh, sensitivity. There are a lot of features here. Those are lines. Some of them we know and understand very well. Some of them coming from the suspension, it's eigenmodes of the suspension, so all the mirrors are suspended in a very sophisticated way to eliminate or reduce influence of the seismic noise. Uh, some other lines are due to electric sockets, so basically the electricity comes with uh, 50 hertz, I think, uh, tucked in, um, in Europe and 40 hertz in the US, so those lines are harmonics of this 40 or 50 hertz will be present there. And besides these lines, that's I think my next slide, there are other artifacts in the data. Um, the noise is stationary, but it's only true on a sh relatively short uh, times of maybe depends on the behavior of the detector. Sometimes it's hours, sometimes it could be um, minutes. Uh, rarely it's a day, but it does happen as well. And we have sometimes uh, some artifacts. So what I'm plotting here is this is frequency, this is time. So this time frequency map of, uh, of the data. And those are various artifacts which we observe in, uh, in the data. And uh, well, some people switched on the imagination, added a little a few more features and put the names on it. Um, some of these guys, we understand where they're coming from, and then engineers uh, go back to the device and trying to eliminate them, but some of them, we have no clue where they're from. We know it's not gravitational wave signals, and I'll tell you why it is uh, true. Um, and, but still, it's very hard uh, when you have such sort of loud, uh, what we call glitches in the data, to uh, basically they corrupt your data and uh, that's the reducing significance of uh, weak gravitational wave signals because of these guys. Why we know that they're not uh, gravitational wave signals? Two reasons. The first, uh, the very simple one. So we have at least two detectors, and if it's gravitational wave signal, it should appear in both detectors, at least two detectors. With Virgo we have three, so it should appear at least in two detectors within the light travel time. And these guys do not. So they appear in one detector, but uh, nothing seen in another detector. If it is gravitational wave signal, they should be consistent. And second reason is, uh, I try to plot it, show it here. So that's how this frequency gain this time, that's how gravitational wave signal looks like. So it's increasing 
uh, in frequency and the amplitude uh, also goes up in, in time. So basically that's what it looks like. And these guys do not look at all like that. And uh, that's the second reason. And we actually even uh, have a test, uh, consistency test. So we split our signal, how it looks like, in time, how it should look, gravitational wave signal in time frequency plane, into parts uh, which would contribute equal power. And then we compare this uh, with the other signals. And you, you basically see that it doesn't follow this pattern at all. And that's one of the ways to eliminate these things from, from, from observations. Of course, it, we, we wouldn't need to do that if it was purely Gaussian noise, but unfortunately, this thing happened. I'll come closer. And uh, I will conclude speaking about ground-based detectors uh, by considering, uh, in general, sources which could be observed and are observed by LIGO and Virgo and whatever is built uh, now, like uh, Kagra in Japan and Elise, uh, LIGO India in India, etc. Um, so, what we had looked at at the various binary systems. I mean, we detected a handful of black holes, binary black holes merging, and one binary neutron star. Probably I should make uh, one step a little bit back and say a few words what are neutron stars and what are black holes. So, let's start with black hole. Black hole first appeared as a solution of Einstein equations, and later on it was brought into astrophysics. Um, it was shown that uh, the very big stars with, uh, with mass more than 8, 10 solar mass, at the end of its life, they will go through the stage where they actually, there is no a gradient of pressure which would uh, counteract the, the collapse, and uh, the core of heavy star will collapse quite often with a supernova explosion. Actually, it's always with supernova explosion of different type. And then it goes, uh, collapse continues, and uh, matter crossing the Schwarzschild radius and becoming black hole. So this uh, black hole solution, which was first obtained as a mathematical entity, uh, found its uh, way to astrophysics. And we believe that uh, one, are you, one <coughs> way of to forming black holes are through the core collapse of a supernova of quite uh, large massive black holes. Uh, sorry, stars. Uh, core collapse itself is very energetic event. As I said, it's uh, accompanied by a supernova explosion and uh, this uh, really, really bright event in the universe. You can see it from far, far away. And during core collapse, if core collapse is a spherically symmetric, which is a very unlikely situation, then we don't have gravitational waves. If it's not spherically symmetric, then uh, some of the energy of the collapse also could be transformed into gravitational waves. This will be burst-like event. Uh, the only thing we do not know, actually, it depends on a lot of things, uh, how collapse proceeds and uh, uh, how asymmetric it is as well. Uh, so we don't know actually amplitude of gravitational wave signal which would be produced during gravitational collapse, but, but most likely it will be there. And if it happens in nearby, and we have supernova explosion nearby once in about 300 years, and the uh, next one might come up anytime soon. Um, so that's another source which uh, people looking at uh, forward to, to see. Um, binary neutron stars. So neutron stars, uh, similar way as the black holes. If a uh, star was not as massive as uh, 8, uh, 10 or 20 solar mass, but let's say 5, 8, 9, um, it will also, co co at the end of its evolution, it also will go through the supernova explosion, but uh, mass of the core is not too big, so it doesn't form black hole but it, it forms neutron star. It's a very compact object with fast rotation, with a strong magnetic field. Um, and it uh, has very interesting, uh, equ um, well, equation of state. So actually, major, uh, most of it we don't know, we don't understand, but there are, you, you could form a superfluid and superconductivity in the core of neutron stars. So it's an interesting object on its own. And, um, 
And we could form uh, two neutron stars if, uh, uh, if, for instance, if two stars in the binary system were to both massive enough. And uh, one thing we're trying to do from uh, gravitational wave observations is to get uh, equation of state information about interior of the neutron star. So we saw one of the event like that. What we didn't see yet, it's a neutron star black hole. Maybe next year, we'll see. So besides binary systems, we could also have a, a gravitational radiation from a single neutron star if it was deformed slightly. And people talking about mountain, but this mountain size is of order of centimeter millimeters. So it's really it's tiny deformation of the crust of the neutron star. So if there is such a deformation, then this creates deform uh, deviations from spherical symmetry, and uh, then there is a quadrupole moment, non-zero, and there is second time derivative of it. And this will emit gravitational waves continuously, very weak, but all the time. So you can simply integrate it over years and years of observation, trying to pull it out. Moreover, we know some neutron stars uh, from electromagnetic observations, and we're trying to do targeted search, so basically looking specifically for gravitational waves from that direction in the sky. Uh, other source uh, which uh, like on Virgo collaborations looking, searching for um, stochastic gravitational wave signal. From, I mean, yesterday there were quite a few questions about this, and I have mentioned this. So, a uh, stochastic gravitational wave signal could be formed by various processes in the early universe. This really noise-like signal, <coughs> I already mentioned yesterday, and then you need uh, more than one detector in order to correlate the data and find the common noise present in all detectors. Are we good here? Clear? Okay, uh, that's all for about LIGO, Virgo, etc. Let's go in space. Laser, laser interferometer space antenna. Uh, so, this project had a long, long history, and only recently it was actually approved within the European Space Agency and become, became a real project. So it's now in phase A, it's a definition phase, and it will be launched around 2032. It's not excluded that uh, it could happen a little bit earlier, but uh, well, we'll see, yet to be seen. So uh, what do I want to say here? Yes, so one of the reasons why Lisa took so long for Lisa to be approved is that uh, technology, it's very new mission. It was never done. Nothing like that was ever done in any space agencies. And uh, we always were pushed back a bit and saying, can you please demonstrate us so that you can achieve this technology first by something smaller, and then we will believe you. And that's how Lisa Pathfinder mission, its technology mission, um, flew a few years ago. And it was extremely successful. So there were two main objectives of the Pathfinder. One is to achieve drug-free systems. So basically, uh, there is a test bodies inside the spacecraft, and you want them to be completely in free fall and detached from the environment. And second uh, is uh, some part of uh, interferometry on board. So uh, what is Lisa is, uh, no, let's, let me finish with the Pathfinder. And the results were absolutely fantastic. It's one of the most successful missions uh, within the uh, European Space Agency. Um, the results were at least 10 times better than was mission requirement. And the credibility of the community now within the European Space Agency is huge, plus gravitational wave detection. LISA will fly. Um, it's still a quite long way, but not as long as uh, you think about space missions. So 10 years, it's not that big. It's not that much. You need to build things, you need to test, and everything must work before you launch. That's the difference between LISA and LIGO and FIRGO. There you can go with a screwdriver and change something. There you cannot. 
Um, I will show you cartoon, but before, it's a bit old cartoon, but before I'm doing that, I want just to describe it a bit in words. Uh, LISA is a three spacecrafts. They're all identical. They're separated by 2.5 million kilometers in a cartoon. It, will be, it was old LISA, 5 million kilometers. Um, the, it's almost equal literal triangle. Uh, each of the spacecraft is in free fall, so it's a freely orbiting, there is no propulsion, it's freely orbiting around the sun, about uh, 20 degrees behind Earth. So you can see here the path of uh, one spacecraft. Um, and the plane of LISA inclines 60 degrees to the ecliptic. So let's go to cartoon. I'll try also to give some comments as we go along. Well, this introduction, unfortunately, a bit long. Yes, so now NASA also joined this project, but as a junior partner. Uh, before, for old LISA, for which this cartoon was made, it was 50-50, now it's much less. Nevertheless, it's a significant contribution, and we're happy to work with our US colleagues. Um, so this is not real, right? It's cartoon. Uh, it takes a while to bring LISA to the orbit because it's quite far away. So as you see, these three identical spacecrafts, satellites. The shape of uh, each uh, satellite now changed because uh, this was pill-like, you know, kind of. Um, but now it's more like a coffin because of the we could not put them properly inside the spacecraft if you use this configuration. So this solar panel, uh, these micro thrusters, they help to adjust position of uh, spacecraft uh, so that uh, solar antenna is pointing toward the sun. And also, uh, also helping a little bit, well, I'll show you this later. This antenna for transmission of the data to, back to us. Each spacecraft has this antenna. And uh, unfortunately, this antenna has to be repointed once in a while. It means that we will have gaps in the data. Never good to have a gaps, but well, it's inevitable. Um, there are reference stars. That's how a spacecraft understands its position. And next, it has to find where the another spacecraft is because they're so far away, it's 2.5 million kilometers, they cannot see each other. So they need to understand, based on the stars, where other spacecraft is. And uh, it's trying to establish the link. It's not 16 seconds, it's actually now eight seconds <coughs> uh, light travel time because it was five million kilometers. And um, these micro thrusters which are attached and they, as I said, they have dual role. First is adjusting spacecraft and second, they're trying to keep test mass, which you will see in a minute inside the satellite. It has to be in free fall. So basically a spacecraft is following where test mass goes. It's sensing where its position, never touches it and trying to follow it. So uh, here it is, uh, acquisition of the links. Um, each laser is very weak. It's about two watts. Uh, you can compare it to 10 uh, watt or 20 watt laser which you used for LIGO. Um, but the key point, <clears throat> it's not like we don't have 20 watts or even higher watt lasers, it's uh, they have to be space qualified. So they should be able to work in space for n years. And uh, then it's a tremendously reducing number of uh, devices which you can use in space. Um, happening now? Uh, yes. Well, let's just look at this. Compare the sizes. Gives uh, orbit. So, um, as you see, triangle as such rotates as well. So it's cartwheeling motion, and the uh, uh, period of rotation of the triangle itself is the same as the orbital period. It's one year. So after one year, spacecraft each spacecraft returns to its original position. Of course, uh, orbit slightly deforms. And uh, arm lengths, I will mention this uh, a bit later as well, uh, they're almost equal. It's, we just have managed to find such an orbital configuration that it's uh, quite stable. 
So it's, it changes by a few meters. And later, I mean, it drifts in time, so it uh, goes worse after uh, four, five, six years. So minimum uh, mission time at the moment is uh, four years, with uh, most likely extension to eight years, maybe 10. So these are telescopes because, uh, as I said, laser light is, uh, laser is very weak. It's not a reflecting interferometer, it's transponding, so because only a few photons which were emitted in one spacecraft are reaching the other one. The angle of the, of the beam becomes huge, so you need to collect uh, laser light with a telescope. There is optical bench which connects a spacecraft to the test mass. Test mass is a, this one, it's a golden platinum cube. This guy is supposed to be freely floating. And the whole construction is just to keep it freely floating and shielding it from environment, from solar wind, cosmic rays, etc. So, uh, of course, uh, cosmic rays is one of the problems. Uh, they induce charge on the test mass, and you need to use ultraviolet light to discharge the test mass, otherwise there is an electrostatic force. I think that's... Uh, it's not that interesting, at least for me. Yeah, so laser is locked and they transmit it later on to the another spacecraft and we have in general six links, you know, from each spacecraft back and forth. Six measurements which were returned to the Earth. <coughs> is there anything more interesting there? Okay. Um, so let's look a little bit more how these things operate. Uh, we have already a preliminary mathematics for that. First of all, I want to say that uh, arms are not equal, exactly equal. For some purposes, it's, uh, it's, we can assume that there are. For some other, in some other calculations, we cannot assume that they are equal. Uh, and operating frequencies between 0.1 millihertz and 0.1 hertz. And what I want to say that uh, if you ask what the gravitational wave frequency so that L omega is equal to one, you remember we talked about this uh, yesterday, you will find that it's about 20 millihertz, so it's really in the middle or in the heart of the LISA band. So we cannot use a global local inertial frame to cover whole LISA. So we need to use a TT frame, transverse traceless frame, in order to do calculations. And we did it yesterday. And that is the change in frequency of the laser light due to interaction of the laser with the gravitational wave signal if you uh, take only one link, so this S sender, uh, unit vector NL, and this receiver. Yesterday you saw integrals, but uh, integrals were because we were looking at the delta phi, change in phase. Here I'm talking about change in frequency, and therefore it's uh, simply H. So it's again projection of HIJ, delta HIJ, on the single link. So I'm looking at the here at single link. K is direction of propagation of gravitational wave, and delta H is the H at time of uh, when light was sent, minus time of when it was received. And you can do some approximation. <coughs> here it is what is exactly. But as I said, travel time is only eight seconds, so it's not that much. You can make approximation. And you can, say, well, here's a T minus LL if you want to continue this line. What I meant here is that that part is approximately LL. Um, that is actually an important thing because it tells us theoretically, theoretically, you can have only one arm to detect gravitational wave. You don't need two, three, four, etc. Just one arm is sufficient. Practically, it is not. And the reason is because of the noise. It's not, if there were no noise, if there was just pure gravitational wave, then uh, you could detect gravitational wave with only one arm. And you can see it's already here, basically. Even that depends on the source. <laughs> you might, I, let me just jump a bit in the next slide, I will explain to you. But the biggest problem is not even location, the biggest problem is um, yeah, I mean, there are some other problems. Some, some of the parameters you wouldn't be able to pull out, but uh, the key point is of many arms is not even that. It's a technological problem. It's a noise, which is uh, so high that you wouldn't be able to see gravitational wave signal at all. 
Right, so this is again constellation of three spacecrafts. I labeled them one, two, three. And uh, I assume for this calculation that all arms are approximately the same. And we usually define delta nu over nu for a single uh, link as a YSLR. S as stands for sender, L for link, receiver. So for instance, the, if you want to consider from two to one, then it will be sender is two, link is three, receiver is one. If you want to do it from three to one, then it will be y three minus two, one, because it's traveling in a direction opposite to what I assumed as a direction of N2. It's just convention. I will not do derivation, it's quite so straightforward. I will just give final expression and I will discuss it. So for single link, the response is given by this formula. This looks like a, a antenna pattern. The only difference is it also in, in, uh, includes inclination of the orbital plane. Okay, IOTA. We talked about IOTA or theta D and the relationship. This polarization angle, this sky location of the source. So this uh, how signal appears, uh, 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 its amplitude appears in the single link response. Then I want to bring your attention to this term, sync, it's a sinus x over x, right? And it has, it's not zero at zero, but it's zero at pi. So it means that uh, at some point this makes the response equal to zero. And this happens where omega L roughly of order one, actually. This was a geometrical factor here. So what it means that when a gravitational wave length is exactly projected gravitational wave length uh, fits into the nodes between sender and receiver, they don't move, and we have zero response. And you will see this in sensitivity, which we'll see in a few slides. Another thing I want to bring up here in this formula, it's this term, and uh, answering partially question about sky localization. So K is a gravitational wave propagation direction, in other words, position in the sky. So if signal is long-lived, you have Doppler modulation of your phase. And if really a signal really long-lived, which there are such signals, then you can get a sky localization even with single link from the Doppler modulation of the phase and also from amplitude modulation. There are other terms, this thing, that thing, and they're coming from the fact that uh, for high, these are important only for high frequencies. And for high frequency, it's a very small effect, but nevertheless, you start to feel propagation effect of gravitational wave along the constellation. So it hits uh, first spacecraft first, and then second, and then third one. And it's small effect because it's only eight seconds uh, apart, light travel time. And nevertheless, at high frequency, it does play a little bit of role, and uh, it works a little bit like triangulation, okay? So it also helps to determine sky localization, etc. But it happens only at high frequency because, as you see, omega L uh, must be larger than one. If it's comparable to one or less than one, this is completely negligible. Um, I say that, I say that. Now, I'm coming to the noise. I'll try to be a bit hand wavy and try to give you main idea. Why do we need the equal arms? So let's look at the, this picture, okay? And let's imagine the Michaels interferometer. There is a beam splitter here. There are end mirrors there. And we send the laser here and there at the same moment of time. One of the biggest noise which are present there is a laser frequency noise. We don't have stable lasers. The frequency of the laser varies quite a lot. And this noise uh, will be the same propagating in along arm two and along arm three. If arms are exactly equal, then return back at exactly the same time. And when you subtract differences, the noise cancels exactly. Because it travels exactly the same time, it recombines at exactly the same time at the end, and you take a minus, it's gone. That's the main reason why you need the two arms. Moreover, it's better if they are orthogonal because response depends on the sinus of the angle. 
So if you have orthogonal arms, it is the best. Unfortunately, it's going to be achieved for uh, Lisa, but uh, 60 degrees, so sinus of 60 is not that bad. When you don't have equal arm, you have a problem, and this is true for Lisa. You cannot maintain equal arm exactly. And uh, there, what we're using is a so-called time delay interferometry. This is post-processing. Once you get the data, all the measure six measurements from the spacecrafts, you're trying to recombine them so that you can cancel laser noise. Let me just try to explain you main idea. So imagine that uh, laser, uh, so now arms are not equal. This arm is not equal to this one, but you're trying to combine the noise in a different way. Imagine that your noise propagates along this arm first, then along the arm here, returns there, and now you subtract it from noise which is propagating in other direction. This way, again, optical path is the same, it's just moving in different direction, and you subtract it and you will get again zero. But you don't do that uh, physically, you're doing it mathematically by delaying your measurements. So you effectively construct red and blue path by applying delays and uh, canceling, uh, again, noise. If you know the arm length exactly at each instance of time, which is also one an issue, well, a little bit of an issue, then you can do it exactly. If you want mathematically what it means, you can introduce delay operator on function f of t, which is f t minus l i, L is arm length, this definition. And then you're trying to construct a polynomial of such delays. Apply to the measurements, uh, let's call it X of T, measurements. This polynomial. in delays, and the sum must be equal to zero for the noise, frequent laser frequency noise. I prefer more physical picture than, well, if you like math, then uh, you just say these uh, polynomials of arbitrary order in the delays applied on the data, laser frequency noise, and you want to find such a polynomials to make it zero, and it's possible. Yes. It's uh, yes. So basically, you have a laser, and the laser frequency fluctuates. Okay. So each uh, time it uh, sends the light, there is this fluctuation. Well, you have each of these measurements separately. You have these measurements, you have that measurements, you have these measurements, you have that measurements. You have six measurements. You have uh, one, two, two, one, one, three, three, one, etc. So you have six measurements, and that's what you're delaying and recombining. So it's like having two lasers? They have uh, three lasers, actually, at each spacecraft. So one at each, yes. And so you don't do this in a f physically, you just take measurements and you delay them so to construct such a problem. Okay, so we can uh, actually not cancel noise uh, identically to zero, but we can suppress it uh, quite a lot and it's good enough for uh, what we want, so it's below other noises which we cannot deal with at all. <clears throat> Right, so I want to just flush sensitivity curve first and uh, all the sources which are possible in uh, LISA band, and then I will talk about each source separately. So first I want to say this uh, uh, green curve is, uh, is uh, instrumental noise. And you can see these wiggles here. These wiggles are coming from the sync function which we saw before. Why they don't go to infinity in principle for individual source they go into infinity. 
We cannot detect, uh, there is some frequency at which we cannot detect the individual source at all. They don't go to infinity because this average curve over all the sky locations. So it's just uh, creates you bump, but doesn't go to, to infinity. Now uh, talking about sources. First I will talk about this cloud of purple stars, uh, purple dots and uh, green stars and this uh, um, gray region. These are galactic uh, binaries from our own galaxy. I will talk about them a bit later. Um, then these curves are massive black hole binaries. This total mass 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 solar mass, which are placed at the redshift equal 3. Here it's what we call extreme mass ratio in spiral. I mentioned them several times already. It's a big black hole, small black hole, small black hole falling into the big one. We will talk about this later. And these sources are, it's interesting, these are LIGO black holes. So it's a LIGO black holes, but you know, back in its past. So when the separation was quite large, so they first will appear in the uh, LISA band, and uh, some of them will never reach LIGO band in our lifetime. Some of them will reach LIGO band in uh, five to 10 years. So they might be first observed by LISA, and let's say five, 10 years later, we might see them not in LIGO Virgo, but whatever successors of those uh, instruments will be there. Now let's go in term and look at the, some sources. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> so, so, no, it's, a, it's acceleration noise. It's a something, it's a, yeah, it's acceleration noise. It's a something, it's influence which we cannot remove. We cannot achieve perfect drug free, and that's what it is. And at high frequency, it's a laser shot noise. <clears throat> right, so massive black hole. So first of all, we believe that massive black holes exist in the, in the center of the nuclear of a, each galaxy. The best example, of course, is our Milky Way, and we know that it contains four million solar mass black hole. We know it because we saw stars orbiting around something which we don't see, and we can estimate from Keplerian law, Kepler's law the, the mass of the central object, and it's very compact and it's dark. And we can extrapolate to other galaxies as well, whatever it is, and you, we believe that uh, there is black hole, massive black hole in the middle of each galaxy. And we also know that galaxy merge. This is not the same galaxy, it's a different galaxy. Um, which we observe different galaxies, but at different stage of the collision of merging. <clears throat> and we also see from other various observations, BLA, Chandra, NASA, etc., uh, that uh, sometimes we have two bright sources, bright because there is accretion in the middle of the merging galaxies. So we do know that, well, we believe that we know that uh, black holes pairing there is one problem is to bring them very close so that gravitational emission is efficient. But uh, I think nature knows solution, even if we don't know. Um, and uh, so, but what the origin of these black holes? That's a big question which Lisa is trying to answer. We believe that uh, black holes started very early in the universe, I mean, started to form together as formation of the galaxies from initial seeds initial seed black holes, and these initial seeds could be different. They could be either small seeds uh, from the very first population of the stars, pop three stars. Those initial black holes could be of mass 100,000 solar mass, and they merge with each other, and the main mechanism to grow mass, actually, it's gas accretion. Or you could uh, form a large seeds black holes by, if you have big cloud, and if it undergoes the direct collapse to black hole, you might form 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 solar mass black hole to start with, and then again. So the black holes uh, merge uh, through the merging uh, collision of the galaxies, but the main mechanism, uh, again, I'm saying, it's uh, due to accretion of the mass. And accretion of the mass, if uh, the accretion disk was formed, implies that uh, it, there is transfer of angular momentum from the gas to the black hole, and we expect that many of these black holes might be uh, highly spinning. 
So this is a tree which shows how black hole could grow from a small mass to masses 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 solar mass which we observe now. Yes, so this is simulation of gravitational wave signal in, uh, from merging black holes in the laser data. And you can see the signal by eye. It's so strong. So if you zoom, you can, uh, this, there is a noise there, it's simulated noise, of course, and you see the signal there. Then there was a question yesterday about precession. I decided to put one more waveform, which is precessing waveform, so you can see the precession here, which modulates the shape of the signal. And also I put this for one uh, more reason, and you can see how spins evolve, you know, each, this component of the spin one, for instance, as you can see how they changing in time, the precession. I want to bring it up also to show you the units. So if you scale your waveform, your H plus, by units dl over m, and you also scale your time by total mass of the system, then this waveform is completely independent of total mass of the system. It depends only on mass ratio. So this waveform will be valid for 30 solar mass binary system or for 30 million solar mass binary system. The only thing uh, difference will be here and there. So if you multiply it back, you will see the, for 30 million it becomes larger in amplitude and longer in time. And the same happens in frequency. So if you <coughs> introduce, uh, let's call it F hat, which is F times M, this dimensional, so these seconds, this inverse seconds, so it's dimensionless frequency. If you, exp you can express your waveform completely in terms of F hat, and then it's, uh, again, you can, the frequency domain waveform again looks like uh, the same in these units, in LIGO band or in LISA band. And also it tells you that, you know, if you go to larger mass, the frequency, characteristic frequency of the waveform becomes slower, so it shifts if you, for supermassive black hole will not appear in LIGO band, they will appear only in LISA band. Um, so this is simplifies waveform modeling. The black hole signal which you model for LIGO is completely applicable for million solar mass binary in LISA. Extreme mass ratio in spirals. This very interesting object, very fascinating. Again, Massive black holes in the galactic center, they should be surrounded by gas and uh, stars and uh, moreover graveyard of stars, like neutron stars, like black holes. And moreover, we believe that uh, there are more black holes in the galactic nuclei, stellar mass black holes kind of, uh, than normal stars because of the dynamical friction, they're more heavy, they will segregate to the center of the potential well much easier than the lighter object. And uh, those neutron stars and uh, solar mass black hole uh, in the galactic nuclei, they interact its end body system. Uh, and uh, from time to time, one of them could be thrown almost precisely toward the massive black hole in the nuclei. Then it forms very eccentric orbit, it starts orbiting, then at some point it detaches itself from the stellar environment and become a binary system, massive black hole plus small compact object like neutron star or 30, 40 solar mass black hole. Uh, it's called extreme mass ratio in spiral because mass ratio could be between 10 to minus 7 and 10 to minus 5. What is important is uh, for the, about this object, it revolves about 10 to the 6 million orbits in the close vicinity of big black hole before it actually plunges. Uh, what do I have next? I think I have a movie now. Does this work? I need to switch it on something. Otherwise I can use them for footage. Yes. Ah, okay. <laughs> yes. So this is a small black hole orbiting a big one. 
uh, at the bottom you see the waveform which it uh, produces, and it's also going to be translated into the sound wave by scaling it to the audible regime. So the orbit looks chaotic, but once in a while it looks a bit regular. And I'll explain about, for instance, like now, uh, I'll explain about uh, why it looks like, uh, like cows uh, a bit later. So here you see duration in days. So here you see average speed at which this body rotates around uh, black holes. So waveform is really long, signal is very long, and uh, look at the structure, it's quite complicated. And that's the best part of it. The fact that you don't hear anything after plunge, it means it's a black hole. So the, sh the, black hole, the waveform should shut down quite abruptly, and you should not see anything coming out afterwards. Um, let me just qu quickly walk you th about, through the extreme mass ratio spiral. <clears throat> Yes. Well, if it's not black hole, you will see a lot of things. And actually, I will talk about this here, mapping space-time. Um, so in principle, the motion looks complicated, but it's not that complicated. You can uh, decompose it in three, in three different motion, in uh, R direction, in theta, and phi. What happens, imagine you have Keplerian ellipse, so, of course, it will have R motion, so it goes from periaps to apoaps. Of course, it has azimuthal motion, it rotates. In addition to that, there is a relativistic effect that this ellipse precessing, and this precession is extreme here because it's very close to the black hole. Precession is so extreme that sometimes you might have several revolutions around black hole before you go out. So, if precession of Mercury is a tiny angle, here you could have 2 pi, 4 pi, 6 pi, before you actually go out. In addition to that, there is spin orbital coupling, so the whole um, plane, uh, this uh, Keplerian plane, is uh, precessing around the spin of the big black hole. So if you decompose into these three elementary motions, it's not that hard. And the whole waveform looks like a harmonics beating of these three fundamental frequencies, and these three fundamental frequencies, of course, slowly changing function of time because of the it's in spiral, so its orbit shrinks. And the uh, waveform becomes uh, stronger when a small body approaches, big black hole, and it's uh, weaker when it's further away. That's uh, how a waveform looks like. And this is precession of the orbital plane. And uh, now there is a, such a thing as geodesy. It's uh, where we send the satellite, little satellite around the Earth, so it it's, uh, it's, uh, flies around the Earth and trying to map the gravitational potential of the Earth. Here, we don't, we, we don't have uh, Earth, we have what we think black hole, massive black hole, and we have small black hole orbiting it. And all the information about the structure of space-time of the big black hole is encoded in the gravitational wave signal in its phase. And so we can use this signal in uh, the same way as we use uh, for geodesy in order to map, to, to, to see what the structure, what the multipolar structure, for instance, of the, of the central object. And we can ask a question whether it's a big, this big compact object, is it really black hole or something else? Is it black hole of general relativity or it's black hole of something else? And uh, echoes, you know, if, for instance, at the end of uh, what we believe as a plunge, we shouldn't see anything. Can we see uh, something there? And this something there, whether it does not exist or not, it again depends whether it's a black hole or not. One alternative to this is a boson star. It's a massive boson star. It's a basically a scalar field with self-interaction. You can make it quite compact, quite massive, but not as compact as a black hole. Okay? Jumping. How Sorry? How Here not. Oh, okay. Here not because it's a very small perturbation. Because it's, uh, it's, 
Actually, yes and no. So it will be, could be seen if uh, black hole, big black hole is almost uh, maximally spinning. So it's 0.999999. Then it's a last long time as you might be able to see by simply integration. But usually we don't have, um, it's very short and uh, very weak ring down here. Because for supermassive black holes, I guess you don't expect them to be For supermassive black holes, ring down is very strong and detectable. When you have two supermassive black holes, ring down signal is a strong and detectable. Oh, sorry, that was my question. So yeah. for generically for Lisa, yeah. the supermassive black hole margins, you can actually trace the ring down. Yes. Yes, and that's another way of trying to see whether it's a black hole or not. I mean, just by looking at quasi normal modes. For this guy, and for, well, fortunately, unfortunately, no. It just really shuts down. The perturbation is so weak because it's just a small plug, and it doesn't see much. Other source is our own galaxy and white dwarfs. What, is, what are white dwarfs? Our sun will become white dwarf. So if you don't have a very massive star, at the end of its life, it burns out of uh, all uh, um, hydrogen, then it burns all the helium in the core and become carbon oxy oxygen, uh, like a crystal. It uh, removes its uh, envelope uh, outer shell and it just uh, cools down slowly, slowly, slowly as a white dwarf. So it's basically the core, remnant core of the star, which is not very heavy like our sun. And uh, this very typical, so our sun is a very typical star in the galaxy. So there are many white dwarfs. And so many white dwarfs are in binaries. The fact that our sun is not in binary is actually uh, a bit uh, uncommon. So more than half of the stars we observe are in binary systems. And uh, we expect to have about 60 million of white dwarf binaries in the Lisa band. Not all of them will be detectable, but all will be there. Out of this 60 million uh, white dwarf binary, about 10,000, 10, 20,000, we will be able to extract individually. And all others will form stochastic astrophysical gravitational wave signal. So it's basically noise like signal, but it's an um, very specific noise because this noise has a modulation. So it's not equal at different time and it repeats itself after one year. Because white dwarfs are mainly in a galactic plane and even majority of them in the galactic nuclei. So sometimes LISA is more sensitive to the galactic plane, galactic nuclei, and then the signal becomes stronger. Then it's, as it moves in the orbit, it points out from galactic plane and nuclei, signal becomes a bit weaker. So, but otherwise, it's uh, still, there are two components, some detectable individual sources, and it's almost monochrom monochrom monochromatic signal, gravitational wave signal. It's all the time in the Lisa band. And some others just form the, it's a inter, uh, superposition of many, many sinusoidal signals. It forms stochastic gravitational wave signal. The interesting thing is these points there is the binaries which we know they exist. We can see them from electromagnetic observations. We know that they're binary, we know their masses. We can place them, we can compute what is the strain of gravitational wave strain from those binaries. We can place them there and we know that we should be able to see them. This guaranteed source. And that was a strong point of LISA all the time. Well, now it's not as strong because we have black holes detection with, LISA, with LIGO, but nevertheless. And this is called verification binaries because they will be used to monitor performance of the instrument. They're not, uh, they're interesting as, a, as astrophysical sources, but the most important are for uh, checking uh, health of, uh, of LISA itself. Right, so a few words about expected event rate in LISA. <coughs> Massive black hole binaries. Uh, quite, uh, it's not very precise number, but uh, let's say because uh, uh, there are quite a few things entering uh, astrophysical assumption, whether it's uh, high mass initial seeds, small mass initial seeds, uh, how quickly black holes approach each other after galaxies uh, merge. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And uh, at the end, uh, event rate between few per year 
to a few hundred per year. Extreme mass ratio in spirals, it's even bigger uncertainty. And there, it's between one per year and 2,000 per year, a few thousands per year. Actually, I prefer a few tens because these signals are very hard to pull out, and when you have few thousands, is a, I don't know how to do that. And I don't know if you will be able to do that even when Lisa flies. Um, then gravitational wave signal from solar mass black holes. Those I told you about, uh, those are signals which uh, 20, 30, 30, 40 solar mass black holes, so this kind of thing. Um, and the broad orbit about 10, 15, 20 years before they uh, will enter ground base frequency band. And the event rate there is about 10 per year. Not much. And it strongly depends on the Galiza configuration, on, for instance, what laser will be used uh, there, uh, and also performance, how much we can suppress high frequency. Uh, sorry, laser noise at the high frequencies. And of course, there is a, always possibility to take stochastic gravitational wave signal. It is the same gravitational wave signal as I mentioned uh, as a LIGO source, LIGO Virgo source. Um, this stochastic gravitational wave signal coming not from isolated C, uh, system, but from um, extended from early universe itself at uh, processes in the early universe, like first order phase transition. Um, Nucleization, Rayleigh gravitational waves, etc. And I want to come back to the same diagram here and just to repeat this, uh, the sources which we discussed here. So these are massive black hole binaries, that's how they look like in uh, frequency, in frequency domain. This is a merger, this is ring down, this is in spiral. You can see the duration of the signals, so it depends on. Uh, their mass and their strength, you might see up to a year probably. Some of them you can see only a day or a few weeks. This extreme mass ratio in spiral, there's a harmonics, so there's a beating a set of three fundamental frequencies. They appear as a harmonics of different strength. These LIGO type uh, black holes, some of them never go to LIGO, which is over there, LIGO Virgo, ground based. Some of them will just stay here, some of them do. The blue line is the first detected gravitational wave signal by LIGO, this one. So it has a signal to noise ratio in LISA around 6, 7, and it will reach uh, ground based frequency range in about uh, 15 years. This cloud is uh, galactic binaries. The stars are verification binaries, and the unresolved background is this gray region. So, in a way, sensitivity has to take into account this uh, astrophysical foreground. And uh, we're trying to learn how to do LISA data analysis. We're simulating LISA data and trying to analyze it. So, if you're interested, that's the web page. <clears throat> I think I'm done with LISA. Yes, other questions here? Okay, ah, yes. Very good question. So if you go back to our previous lecture, there is a delta T, we have a look at the time to coalescence, okay? You put the parameters of this binary system, you put some, uh, well, the only thing you need to adjust probably, it's very sensitive to is what is your starting frequency. So for instance, for this blue source, you need to start it around, uh, to have maximum signal to noise ratio. It, of course, it's done by hand, and it could happen anywhere, but if it's uh, roughly 12 millihertz, starting initial frequency, you will find that delta T is roughly 15 years. Okay, and I'm going to data analysis. I'll try to be quite basic and quite descriptive, um, but let's see. So this is actually raw data, and inside this raw data there is a signal. 
If you look at the strain amplitude 10 to minus 19, here's 10 to minus 1. When you see everywhere in a, in a nice figure, you know, this is noise, this is signal that you see it by eye. Yes, but this is pre-processed data, well, post-processed data. It's not exactly raw data. You need to filter it, so you need to remove high and low frequency component of the noise in order to see that. If you just take the raw data, that's what you see. So basically, signal is really buried in there. And what we are doing, we're using so-called match filtering techniques to search for the, the signal. This is a very powerful technique if you know how your signal look like. And it's quite uh, widely based in arranging. So you send the signal, it reflected back, and you're searching time of arrival of the signal because you know its shape. <clears throat> Roughly speaking, we're doing the same here. And so we're correlating the data with the expected signal. And the correlation could be written in frequency domain, this data in frequency domain, this what you're looking for in frequency domain star is complex conjugate, uh, and you integrate this, but uh, there is also denominator. Denominator is saying that uh, if it's white noise, you don't need this. But uh, if your noise is not white, and our noise is not white, if you remember, it uh, has this shape. So it's a quite high noise at uh, high and low frequencies. And you need to take into account, it means that even if the signal has a low frequency component or very high frequency component, you will not see it because the noise is too high. And this acts as a weight at different frequency to your correlation. So um, you don't know that, uh, let's assume that you know the exactly how signal looks like and you're trying to basically look at the time of arrival. This again cartoon. This, well, this is a real data and a real signal, but this is not, okay? And you're trying to correlate and shift this, uh, your what we call template, that's the signal which we are, shape of the signal which we look, which we search for, at different times. And you get signal to noise ratio at different, as a function of time. So we're shifting it here, still low, and once we start matching our template with the signal which was in the data, we have this burst of signal to noise ratio. That's how you will find time of arrival of your signal. And you need to do it uh, for all your data. Um, another complication is uh, for the previous figure, I have assumed that I know exactly how the signal looks like. But the signal depends on many parameters. And we don't know what those parameters are. So we need to vary these parameters. And uh, we need to somehow to, to understand which parameters are better fit to the data or worse fit to the data. So let's assume that our data contains noise and the signal. And we know, that we know that signal is there, for instance, let's assume for a second that we know, but we don't know what the parameters are exactly there of the signals. So what I want to say is that let's try to vary the parameters, create many, 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 many what I call template, sub subtract them from the data, and if we manage to fit parameters of the signal, then subtracting it, what we will should be left with is a noise. So this is simulated data, it contains signal. We don't know which signal it contains. We have created several uh, templates, what I call with different parameters, theta 1, theta 2, theta 3. And we subtract it from this uh, simulated data. These are residuals. If what we subtracted is, was a real signal, then the residual should look like noise. And we are looking at the residuals which uh, most uh, noise look like residuals. Now, looking at these residuals, which of these residuals looks like more like a just pure noise? Middle, yeah? yeah? Any other opinion? You're right. Yes, uh, the signal which was put there is this red one, and indeed uh, this uh, looks like most like a noise because here there are residuals which contain uh, signal because we, our template did not match what was there. 
So here it's closely matched. Uh, but as you see, the blue and uh, red, uh, no, actually the other way around. The signal which was uh, there, it's actually blue. But if you're trying to vary parameters and uh, ask the question of what uh, the residuals which looks like more like a noise, you will find that actually it's not a blue but a red. It, it's called maximum likelihood estimator. So because noise affects a little bit your signal which is inside the data, okay, your estimation will not be perfect. Your, uh, what you will get out of your, what you minimize or maximize your likelihood will not perfectly fit the signal which was there because signal is corrupted by noise. And uh, the red is uh, close enough and uh, esti estimated parameters is the theta 2 ml, which are close enough to theta 2 but not necessarily identical. If your signal in the data is strong, and the stronger signal it is, the closer theta 2 maximum likelihood estimator to theta 2, it, that's what we call unbiased estimator. Or if you average over all possible noise realizations, you should also approach to the true values. And that's actually the basis for constructing the likelihood function. So data minus template should be noise. And that's an example how it is done on uh, LIGO data. So you have LIGO data. That's what I said, it's uh, filtered already data, it's not really raw data. And uh, the best estimator is given by this black curve here and there, this uh, Hanford uh, data, this Livingston data, there are two LIGO detectors. And these are residuals, and indeed as you see, residuals look like noise. Uh, I have a bit of time. Let's look, uh, talk about likelihood and then we will stop and continue tomorrow. No, not tomorrow, but Friday. Let's assume that data indeed contains the signal. And we're trying to, uh, so we assume that there are, in general there are two hypotheses, okay? The data contains noise only or data contains noise plus signal. Um, and first you need to answer this question. Is there a signal in the data? And uh, you doing search, and you estimate you uh, get some statistics. For this statistic, usually you estimate, or actually you set by hands false alarm rate, and then for given false alarm rate, you're trying to assess significance um, of your statistics applied to the data. But now for, I want to assume that you already detected you you found something interesting in your data. And your hypothesis is a model H1 that data contains noise plus signal, and signal is parameterized by some parameters theta. And we construct the templates because, as I said, we don't know the, what parameters of the signal are. And if parameters of the template and, uh, and the template itself matches exactly the signal, then data minus this template should be noise. So the likelihood which we're constructing is the following, that the probability of data given hypothesis one contains given the signal is a P of data minus S and equal to noise. So that's a basically idea. So if you subtract um, probability, uh, assuming that there is a signal in the noise, and by subtracting exactly the signal from the noise, you should have prob probability equal probability of the noise. So, if you assume your, your noise is Gaussian, then this should be Gaussian probability. And that's exactly what is written here. So, we do assume quite often that the noise is Gaussian, and uh, then our likelihood becomes simply the probability, the, uh, the Gaussian probability. These brackets, I think I'm missing one more, are actually defined by this correlation which have, we have discussed earlier. So this is our likelihood, which encapsulates basically our knowledge that we assume that there is a signal, and if we subtract the signal, then the, we will have noise only, and we assume that this noise is distributed according to the Gaussian process, Gaussian stationary noise.
And what we are doing, uh, we're trying to search over the likelihood to maximize it, so basically uh, to make it more noise-like. And the uh, parameters which are uh, obtained by maximization of likelihood are called maximum likelihood parameters. Okay, I think uh, let me just wrap it up and let me just summarize what we were talking about today and I will continue this tomorrow. Um, so, we have finished with the LIGO and Virgo. In my lectures I concentrated on binary systems. Moreover, I concentrated on binary black holes. Um, and uh, besides binary black holes, we have detection of binary neutron star. The main difference with binary neutron stars is at the merger. Merger of black hole and neutron stars is completely different. And uh, for neutron stars it's quite messy and because it involves matter and uh, it's a very complex also numerical simulations for the merger of neutron star. Unfortunately or, uh, for um, physics, we do not see much of the merger with current sensitivity because merger of two neutron stars happens at quite high frequency. At so high frequency where noise starts rising already and the merger happens somewhere here. It is good for numerical relativity because uh, nobody can say that they're wrong and their waveforms are not very good, but it's bad that it is uh, there where we can actually start to could, uh, could see equation of state of neutron stars and other physical effects. Also, other sources for LIGO, we said it's uh, core collapse, stochastic gravitational wave signal, then we switch to LISA. I hope I managed to introduce LISA concept to you and uh, how measurements are performed. Then I try to walk you through all the sources which we are supposed to see in the uh, LISA band. Of course, the most interesting source is uh, those which we do not anticipate. And there is always a place for surprise, and I hope there will be such surprises. And then I have started some basic of data analysis and introduced the likelihood and much filtering. And I think let's stop for now. Thank you very much. <laughs>